three, two, one, zero. We have to miss and we have to go on the two thirteen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Space and Rocket Center. I'm Deborah Barnhart, the CEO and Executive Director. I'm uh, very happy to have you at what we call the Pass the Torch series. Uh, we try to invite in interesting people from all kinds of disciplines to come, and thanks to Logicor Company, we are able to do this free to the public and don't have to charge admission. We're also very grateful this year to Intuitive Research for sponsoring the golden anniversary of Apollo for our community and for the Space and Rocket Center. How many of you have seen the fabulous new planetarium that they brought to our community? I tell you, those who haven't, it is a wonder and it is a, an investment in our community for generations to come. It's an 8K digital laser projector, Evans and Sutherland, with the finest Christie projectors being made in the world right now. Not only is it just like a planetarium show, like you're thinking, hey, great time to take a nap. No, this is a place where we have live shows and you can ask the planetarium people to take you to any destination of your choice, Alpha Centauri or any planet. We also have dramatic presentations, including one about Galileo while he's in prison because he thinks, you know, that the sun is the center of our earth instead of, you know, the earth. So it's more than the planetarium experience that you've ever had before. Friday nights are always special. We're able to serve booze, so we sometimes have cosmos and cocktails. And some Friday nights we have family nights. So please check on our website and come out and join us on Friday nights if you're working all during the day. Uh, we also want to say thank you to Glen Raven Incorporated. It's the world's most innovative fabric based on market-driven solutions, and they've been providing support for the recording and digital archiving of all of the Pass the Torch series that we've been having during this Apollo anniversary. The, um, this year's panel series is a collaboration between many volunteers, but there are two special committees that have been part of our 50th anniversary celebration in the community. There's the German Heritage Committee, which has brought to life all of those many wonderful, I call them old news stories and new old stories, that some of us have heard and some of us have never heard. They worked with the uh, NASA Heritage Committee. And I want to thank uh, Benny Jacks and Jack Stokes and Heidi Collier. Are you in the room? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> so WHNT TV and Rocket City Digital Media are recording all of these panels and they're all going to be available online at WHNT and at rocketcenter.com at the end of the Apollo celebration. So I look forward to you going back and seeing some of the panels that you might not have seen before. Today's Pass the Torch presentation is a very special one featuring Apollo 15 command module pilot Al Warden and author Francis French. Now, as the command pilot for Apollo 15, Al had uh, a really interesting experience, much different than many of the other astronauts. What he did is widely regarded as the greatest exploration mission that humans have ever attempted. He spent six days orbiting the moon, three of those completely alone. And at that time, he gained a Guinness World Record for the most isolated human being. He was 2,235 miles from any other human being. He also had a prestigious career at NASA. The Apollo 15 mission capped at this career. He had already worked on Apollo 9, Apollo 12, as well as, of course, Apollo 13. Uh, we are thrilled to have Al. He's a great friend of the center. This is not his first trip at the rodeo here at the Rocket Center, and we're thrilled to have him with us. We also have a second guest today who will be taking the stage with Al. Originally from Manchester, England, Francis French has spent more than a decade working to make science and technology accessible and understandable to family audiences in museums and science centers in the United States. He's an author, space historian, and a member of the Space Camp Hall of Fame. So that means he's one of our, this year, one million Space Camp graduates. We will reach one million graduates finally this year. So we're very excited about it. So I really love that he's a Space Camp graduate. Um, Colonel Warden, are you, are you a Space Camp graduate? It's, it's never too late, so <laughs> never too late. 
We had a lady 100 years old graduate from space camp, so you are never too late for adult space camp. Um, following this presentation, um, we will have you have the capability to have signed the book that Colonel Warden and Mr. French wrote together called Falling to Earth, an Apollo 15 astronaut's journey to the moon. So stand by, welcome to the podium. We really look forward to hearing from you and welcome to the Rocket City. Okay. Thank you Don't so much. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deborah, for that wonderful introduction. It's, it's, it's really nice to be back here. I should mention, with this Apollo 11 50th, um, all of these Apollo guys are being pulled in as many different directions as you can imagine. You can imagine the number of people who are trying to get hold of them in D.C., in Houston, at the Cape. And Al is here, which was a decision that he made happily because this is the home of the Saturn V rocket that launched him. And so I think we should be particularly grateful that with all the different things you've been offered that you're here. So I, I want to say thank you for being here, Al. And I'm sure these people do too. This, you know, this is the place. We would not have gone to the moon if it hadn't been for Marshall. And, you know, I didn't do a lot of work here because I worked with uh, the command module people out in California. Uh, the Saturn V came out of here, uh, and we owe everything to a small group of people who built the Saturn V here and did all that, and I knew them all. I knew most of them pretty well. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm so happy to come back because this is, this is where it all started. This is where it all got done. This is what made the Apollo program possible was the work that was done here. Very true, and, and coming here as a teenager, as Deborah mentioned, I came here through space camp in the 1980s, good grief, and um, loved it, and that really sparked my space interest. So not only do you get rockets, I got the, the space interest that ended up meaning we wrote a book together. So we, we both owe this place a lot of stuff, I think, in, in various ways. Though not, I don't owe my life quite as much as you owe your life to some of the stuff they did here. But, but in writing Falling to Earth, which came out on the uh, 40th anniversary of your flight back in 2011, um, I really enjoyed working with Al. You know, there are lots of astronauts you can meet who you hope they're going to be everything you want, and then they turn out to be not what you hope they're going to be. You know, they don't, they don't have that, let me tell you what it was like to go kind of gleam in their eye. The thing I loved working at with Al was he has those stories. He tells those stories direct. Um, I hope you get the book today if you haven't already read it because it really comes across in the book. But I had this very Thanks unique experience of, of sitting there with you on your, in your house while you told me those stories direct. And it seems such a shame that I got that and nobody else did. So I, what I thought I wanted to do today was ask Al some of those questions I asked him back there and you get that experience. The great thing and the terrifying thing about working with Al is I have no idea where, where he's gonna go with this. This is not scripted. These are things I remember him ask, giving me good answers to, but what he says today is whatever he says today. So this could be fun. You know, you know the you know the problem with having someone like Francis write help you write a book. He knows too damn much. <laughs> We're not going to tell him those stories. We're not, oh no. <laughs> so you be careful what you ask. <laughs> but one which comes up a lot, and you know, it came up in the introduction here, is you know, you went all the way to the moon, quarter of a million miles away, six days in orbits, three three days, you know, totally alone. You didn't get to land on the moon. People always talk about the 12 guys who landed on the moon. They don't generally talk about the wider 24 people who went to the moon, you included. But when they do, they always like, oh, you didn't get to land on the moon. And yet, you have a very different answer to that. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's important that people understand the way the system was designed back in those days. There are three guys on the crew. The commander is the guy who flies the lunar module down the surface and back up again. The lunar module pilot flies with him, but the lunar module pilot never flies a machine. He is not part of the active flying of a machine. He is there as a systems engineer. Unfortunately, he never gets to fly anything. The command module pilot flies him out there, stays in orbit while by himself, and then flies everybody back home. So the command module pilot gets most of the flying time, the real flying time on the flight. The other thing is that Back in those days in the program, if you wanted to be a commander, 
uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a future flight, then the way to do that is to become, be a command module pilot first. Very simple. There are two vehicles involved in landing on the surface of the moon. One's a command module to get you out there, and the other's a lunar module to get down to the surface once you get there. That's two vehicles that you've got to learn. Now, if you're a lunar module pilot and you never flow anything, then you've got to learn both those vehicles before you could become a commander. If you're a command module pilot, you, always have, you already have the command module. You've done that, been there, done that. You have to learn one vehicle, and that's the lunar module pilot. So if you go back over the records of the Apollo program, you'll find that almost every single commander on a flight was a command module pilot or something like that before he became a commander. And the only exception to that was Apollo 17, when Gene Cernan, who was a lunar module pilot before, uh, became the commander on, on, on 17. Um, and the other, the other the, there's another part of that too, and that is those who walk on the moon, I, you know, I don't take any, guess what their prime objective was when they're on the surface of the moon? Pick up rocks. Now that's a really tough intellectual thing, right? <laughs> you, 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 their, their job was to pick up every different, every color, different rock. color rock they could find on the surface of the moon, okay? My job was to photograph the moon, do remote sensing of the moon, do low light level photography, do visual observations. I had a list of things to do that was a mile long. But their job was to pick up rocks. So I'm glad I was a CMP, even though they even though they shut down the program and I never got any beyond that. I was happy to be there. Um, I should add also that uh, I've been asked many times. See, we've got that uh, Guinness record uh, being the most is it the most isolated guy, most isolated guy in history. I'm not I'm not I I don't know that that's true. I mean, somebody picked out a number, and I guess. Probably because I happened to be in England at the time, and they happened to be having a meeting. And they said, you know, we got this guy coming. Why don't we give him a certificate? Well, what can we give him? Well, let's make him the most isolated guy in history. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's true. I don't know whether I'm more isolated than Mike Collins or Stu Rusa or he, Ken Manning. He's a very remote person. Evans. You can tell he's an extremely <laughs> remote know. guy. I don't yeah. know. But anyway, they gave me that, they gave me that certificate. Uh, the real one was for doing a spacewalk on the way home, but uh, that's, that's another story. Well, that's something that comes up a lot, too. Yeah, they, you're, you are the world record holder as being further away from any other human being than anybody else. You were uh, on the far side of the moon, orbiting the far side of the moon. There are two other people walking on the other side, and then everybody else back on Earth. That's and what I've been told. That's what you've been told, but, you know. But the, and, and the, where most people's minds go is that must have been incredibly lonely. That must have been incredibly isolating. And again, I found just just like I imagined you'd want to walk on the moon more than what you did, and it turned out to be the other way around. I also, your answer to whether that was lonely was very different from well, what we expected. Okay, Francis, you gotta, gotta understand. Uh, there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Now, I think a lot of us can, can, can understand that. I mean, some, there are times when we like to be alone. So if we like to be alone, we're certainly not lonely, okay? so. I spent three days in orbit by myself, and I was alone, but I was sure not lonely. I enjoyed the heck out of it for a lot of reasons. One is I could do all the science that I had to do without any interference from anybody else. Uh, the other was I was my own boss. I was the only one of the three on the crew that was authorized by management to make maneuvers by myself with nobody else overlooking my shoulder. The whole idea of the lunar module pilot is to look over the commander's shoulder on the way down to the moon surface and make sure that everything is okay, okay? So you got two guys looking at everything. I'm, the command module pilot is the only one who's authorized to make a maneuver by himself. Um, the other thing is that um, after being with those two guys. <laughs> Here he comes. For four and a half days, in a machine about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, I was so happy to get rid of them for a while. <laughs> uh, go somewhere else and play. And uh, so that, it was kind of fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed all of myself. And being on the far side of the moon, you had some experiences which are probably my favorite part of the book. You are around the far side of the moon. You are out in the shadow of the, the sun. You're in the shadow of the Earth. The, the, every light, apart from starlight, is 
you have a you, you're in a unique place in the universe that no that's, human that, has been before. Well, yeah, as you know, we, we've talked about this before. That's was probably the most incredible part of the flight for me. Um, I was able to see the Earth rise over the lunar horizon 75 times while I was there, once every two hours. And that was a magnificent view because it's the only colorful thing in the solar system. It's home, it's planet, but it's pretty small. You can put your thumb out and cover it, okay, from the moon. It's not much bigger than the moon is from here. Uh, but the thing that really grabbed my attention was looking the other way. As Francis just mentioned, there was a portion of my orbit where I was shadowed from both the sun and the earth. So I was in complete darkness as far as the solar system is concerned, and all I could see were stars. I could see stars, I, so many, so many stars. In fact, it was very difficult to pick out a star because there were so many stars, it was just a whitewash uh, out there uh, as far as I could see. I could see. I could see the horizon of the moon, all the little mountains and everything around the horizon of the moon, not not by because they're lit, but because of the starlight that they cut off. I could see there were so many stars. I could see a very distinct outline of uh, of the horizon of the moon. Uh, so I, uh, the, 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 I, I got kind of enthralled with looking at the rest of the universe out there, and and you know it, it kind of makes you feel like what where do we fit into all this? Uh, there is a huge universe. We are part of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we look through the Milky Way. We don't look down on it. If you were to look down on the Milky Way galaxy, it would look like a starfish that is slowly turning. But we look through it. And not very many people realize that there are 400 billion, with a B, 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 400 billion. Think about that for a minute. 400 billion stars in our own little galaxy. And if you count up all the galaxies that they've now discovered through the Hubble and all these other large uh, uh, telescopes that are out there today, um, it doesn't take long to realize that there are a couple of hundred billion galaxies out there. I can't count that high. I can't even think about how many zeros there are with that. But that tells you certain things uh, that are sort of um, uh, intuitive, I suppose. Um, um, I, 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 I got so enamored that I went back and started reading Carl Sagan all over again. And uh, if any of you remember Carl, uh, he was the guy who wrote the movie, who wrote the story that the movie Contact was based on. And he was a big proponent. You know, he put all of the, of the, of the pictograms on the Pioneer when it went out uh, to let anybody out there know where we are in the universe, where, where we reside. Carl wrote a book called Intelligent Life in the Universe, and he did that with a Russian astronomer. And the bottom line of the book was that no matter what number you want to pick, like a billion stars are going to be a certain percentage of those that are going to have stars the size of our sun, and a certain percentage of those that are going to have planetary systems, a certain percentage of those that are going to have Earth-like planets in, 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 in orbit around that particular star. And his bottom line was that no matter how you cut it, somewhere, somewhere, some, somehow, somewhere, there's going to be intelligent life out there. So there is going to be other, not, they may not be human kind, but there's going to be intelligent life out there. And he goes even further to say, if they come, if they live on a planet that has a higher gravity than we do, then they're going to be short and strong and squat. But if they... Come, if they live on a planet that has less gravity than we have, then they're going to be tall and string bean and thin. So he's got that all, he had that all figured out, and that's all intuition and kind of, uh, 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 kind of intellectual drive that he had. But that was the thing that, that, really, that really got my attention, uh, was uh, looking out at the universe out there um, and, and, and trying to figure out where, what our place is in, in the universe. I find it fascinating that we can read books, we can intellectualize this stuff, we can know it as a thought, but to actually be around the far side of the moon and kind of feel it and know it as this tiny little speck of humanity away from everybody else, getting that. So thank you for sharing that as the, our ambassador of, back then. One, else, one thing else, else you did, you know, around the moon, you talked about seeing the Earth rise, which, you know, and there's that beautiful picture you took of that heartbreakingly beautiful crescent Earth rising above the surface of the moon as you orbit. 
you did something special every time you, the Earth was about to rise, which no other mission had done before. Oh, okay. My, there's a little story involved in this. Um, <clears throat> I had a very unique individual who taught me the lunar geology, the, uh, the, 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 the large, what I call macro geology. Now, Dave, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin did the micro geology. They're the ones who went down and picked up all the rocks, the colored rocks. I had to look at big features, and I had to uh, kind of analyze whether those big features were volcanic or meteor impact, and there was big arguments going on back then. I, I was quite surprised that the astronomers and the geologists were arguing about whether the features on the moon were volcanic or meteor impact. Uh, and, you know, as it turns out, it's a little of both. I mean, it's a combination of things. We find both. Uh, but the guy who taught me that, 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 that large-scale Geology was an Egyptian guy named Farouk El Baz, and a lot of people know about Farouk. Um, he was, he, he's still a very close friend. Uh, we're in touch all the time. Uh, a wonderful guy. Uh, he was a wetback. Okay? He was a wetback from Egypt. You know what a wetback is. Anybody who crosses water to get someplace else, even though they're unofficial in doing it. Now, he escaped from Egypt back in the day. I have to tell you the story. Wonderful guy. He was a petroleum geologist in Egypt, and uh, he went to uh, Heidelberg University to get his, uh, uh, to get his uh, master's degree. And then he went to MIT to get his uh, PhD. While he was at MIT, he met and married a very wonderful, dark-haired, blue-eyed Irish girl. So here's a combination of an Irish girl and an Egyptian guy that got married. And they went back to Egypt, and the Egyptian government would not recognize their wedding, their marriage. So she stood in line day after day after day after day, and they would not talk to her. And she finally got disgusted with the whole thing. She got on an airplane and went back to Boston. In the meantime, because of the issue that they had presented to the Egyptian government, they conscripted Farouk and sent him out to the Sinai to teach uh, uh, geology to uh, uh, the army out there. Um, and one day he got, a, he, he got an invitation from Heidelberg to come and give a lecture. And uh, lo and behold, surprisingly, the Egyptian government allowed him to go. So he went to Heidelberg, gave his lecture, got on an airplane, went to Boston. That's why I call him a wetback, because he came over unauthorized. Uh, I think he very quickly became, became OK in our country. And he went to work for Bell Labs uh, as a geology instructor. OK. We did all this geology stuff, but we're looking for something a little unusual to do on our flight. So what we did is we came up with a phrase, and it was the phrase was called, Hello, Earth, Greetings from Endeavor, which was my spacecraft. And Farouk translated that into, I think, 10 or 12 different languages. And he gave me all the phonetic way to say it. And so every time I came around, I picked a different language, and I said, Hello, Earth, Greetings from Endeavor. And I did that 75 times on the flight. And it was something that nobody had ever done before. So it was kind of neat because it kind of tied us in with everybody back home. And that was all due to fruit. That was his, that was his project. Yeah. So let me take you back to the morning that Dave and Jim are about to separate in the lunar module, go down to the moon. You've all been asleep um, orbiting the moon. You wake up. You take the covers off the window. And you get quite a surprise. Yeah. Big surprise. Um, have to set the stage. We had the landing that was the furthest m away from the lunar equator. All the flights that had gone before 15 landed in a, ba a band around, uh, uh, north and south of the equator of about 10 degrees because we knew all of the gravitational constants in that little band around the lunar equator. We knew very little about the gravitational constants when we got beyond that band. And our landing say was 27 degrees north. If you look at the moon at night and you look at those big dark circles on the moon, those circles were all formed by huge meteor impacts billions of years ago, long time ago. But those meteors left huge amounts of mass underneath the lunar surface on the side in which they hit the moon, okay? The result of that was that the, well, several things happened. One is that the center of gravity of the moon moved away from the center of the moon, 
And that's why the moon only looks one way at the Earth. It's like a fishing bobber that always points up and down, no matter what the water does, okay? The moon, we only see one face of the moon because of that offset gravity. But those individual meteor craters also left erratic gravitational forces over them, okay? So it, the gravity around the moon is not uniform at all. There are some, as you go over the moon's surface, there are some places where the gravity is stronger than it is in other places, and that stronger gravity will pull you down. And the more you go around the moon, the more it pulls you down. Well, we went into orbit the night before the landing and uh, went to bed, went to sleep, put shades in the windows. Our landing site was a place called Hadley Rill, which is 27 degrees north, and it was, it was a linear feature on the surface of the moon that was caused by lava flowing. But Dave had to fly over a mountain before he got to the landing site, and that mountain was Mount Hadley, which was 15,000 feet high. I put us in an orbit that was 60 miles high behind the moon and 50,000 feet above the landing site, which was 35,000 feet above the top of that mountain. Got up the next morning and I pulled the shade out of the window and I'm looking up at the top of the mountain. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how my heart went, ugh. I called Houston and they said, yeah, their response was, we're sure glad you called. <laughs> uh, we, we think you're getting a little close to the top of the mountain. And so I said, well, how, how close are we getting? And they said, well, you've been dropping in your orbit all night long because of these gravitational constants of the moon, and we now have you at, as I remember the numbers, 33,000 feet above the landing site, plus or minus nine. Now, anybody who's ever grown up as an engineer or has anything to do with math knows that if somebody gives you an answer to a problem that has a plus or minus on it, they don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> okay? So you gotta take the worst case. So 33 minus nine is 24. The top of the mountain was 15,000. We went over that mountain somewhere between seven to 10,000 feet. And I gotta tell you, we could see some pretty small rocks just looking out the window. So we very quickly got Dave and Jim into, their lunar, into the suits and into the lunar module, and I went back into a 60-mile uh, uh, orbit around the moon as soon as I could get rid of them, which was another reason I was glad to get rid of them. <laughs> so talking to Dave and Jim, there are dozens of photos of each of them on the moon, some of the most iconic pictures you'll ever see out in the galleries here, some of the really famous pictures of people standing on the moon saluting the flag. Great photos. There's, there's only one picture of you from the whole mission. What does it right. show? My biggest problem with the flight, yeah. Those guys had all the cameras. They had the video camera, they had the uh, Hasselblads, they had all the cameras, they had a sequence camera, they had them all down on the surface of the moon. They took 7,000 pictures of each other on the moon, okay? <laughs> I'm in orbit by myself. I do not do selfies. <laughs> so there's nothing of me in orbit. My big chance is to have a picture taken of me when I'm doing an EVA, I'm doing a spacewalk on the way home, to recover film in a couple of big cameras that I had. So I'm thinking, yeah, that's gonna be, that's gonna be my, my reward for being a good boy, letting them take all the cameras, they're gonna get all these pictures of me. The camera jammed after one frame, <laughs> and all I have is me going out the hatch. So all you see is my ass going that way. <laughs> That's the only picture I got of me in the flight. See, he knows all my secrets. <laughs> there was a, a slightly nicer view that you got, which was when you're out there, you, you know, you're the very first person to ever do this deep space EVA. People have done spacewalks around the Earth, they've walked on the moon, but nobody's ever got outside as a spacecraft is traveling between the Earth and the moon. You, you got to see something that no humans ever had the chance to see before, which is see the entire Earth and the entire moon just by turning your head. That, to be that far out in deep space must feel very different from going around a, the moon or the Earth. Yeah, that was a, kind of a unique place. We were uh, about 50,000 miles this side of the moon. We we're 196,000 miles out. Now, I know that numbers don't add up, but that's because we're offset from the center line between the Earth and the moon coming back. We're making a loop coming back. So we're offset from that center line. And um, 
I can remember, uh, I went out and got the film and brought it back in and gave it to Jim to store and I uh, went back out a third time. We had foot, I had foot restraints uh, in the side of the service module. I stuck my feet in those and stood up on the outside of the service module and just by turning my eyes I could see both the earth and the moon at the same time. Uh, kind of a unique place to be in. Uh, kind of, it, it really makes you think uh, that you can see both those things at the same time. A pretty, pretty unique place. The other thing was they wouldn't let me take a camera out there because they couldn't figure out anything that I need to take a picture of. Then I tried to convince the people, the engineering people back at NASA that, yeah, I, no matter what, there's going to always be something that you need to take a picture of. But they wouldn't let me take a camera. So I don't have any pictures of any of that. So I had to get a, I had to get an artist to draw the picture that I could have done with a camera. And that picture is a Pierre Mion picture. And if you ever get to the Air and Space Museum, it's one of their prized pictures that they have there, is that picture of, it's, it's from my perspective, it shows Jim Irwin standing up in the hatch. I'm reflected in his helmet. Behind him is the moon. It's an unbelievable picture, and he got it right. Uh, the, the other thing I should say about that was that there was an engineering reason to take a camera out. We had little rocket motors, quad motors called RCS quads uh, at each 90 degree point on the service module and that they, we used those to uh, 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 change attitude or to do, a, to do some maneuvering of the spacecraft. Those little RCS quads stuck up off the side of the service module by about a foot and uh, I could see from the exhaust from those RCS quads that they had burned the mylar on the side of the service module, which nobody had really expected beforehand. So a picture of that would have been really nice for the engineers. Uh, so anyway, what happened is that the, all the guys in my job, the CMPs after me, were allowed to take cameras out there so they could take pictures uh, because that was another thing that we had to, I had to get Pierre to paint that into that picture so that uh, there was a record of it. So you're coming back to Earth from what most people consider the greatest exploration that humans have done to date. You've spent all that time around the moon doing your own experiments. You've had people driving a car on the moon for the very first time, doing some incredible geology down there. Everything's gone great. You're in the last few minutes of the mission coming down through the atmosphere, and the parachute's open, and then you get another view that makes you think, maybe, maybe this mission isn't quite over yet. Well, we, yeah. If, if you all remember, I don't know how many of you ever watched our flight, but... Uh, or, or seen some videos of it afterwards, but um, we did have a little bit of a problem uh, on reentry. Uh, everything was fine until we got down to about 8,000 feet. At 10,000 feet, the main chutes came out. We had three of them. And at about 8,000, I could see one chute developing big holes in it because I'm sitting in the left couch looking out the window. And it was big holes were developing in one of the parachutes. And... Uh, it finally collapsed, so we came down on two chutes. As we were landing, I could see in the second chute some holes start to develop. Turns out that the fuel that, that, that was used in those little RCS quads that I just talked about, that fuel's called hypergolic fuel, and if you just put the two fuels together, it burn, they burn, and they're, and they're almost explosive, but they're very toxic, they're very corrosive, uh, really bad stuff. That fuel, as we, as we, as we would land, without doing anything, would still be in the fuel lines. And if we hit something on the surface uh, of the ocean that would break a fuel line, then we'd have this really bad stuff coming up into the, into the spacecraft. So the idea was that we would purge all that out of the fuel lines on the way down to get rid of any toxic or uh, uh, um, bad you know, fuel that, that could cause us some harm. So I did that on the way down, but what happened and it never happened again, but on our flight, uh, the weather pattern was such that the winds were blowing in exactly the right direction as we came down, that that fuel, instead of blowing away from the spacecraft, went up the shroud line for that one parachute, and went all the way into the parachute, and that corrosive fuel just loved that nylon, and it started eating it up right away, and so we came down on two chutes. Interesting that the normal rate of descent on an Apollo spacecraft was 28 feet per second, which is about the rate that a paratrooper would come down. A guy in a parachute all on his own, about 28 feet per second would be about normal for that sort of thing. 
We lost one shoot, and our rate of descent went up to 31 feet per second. We only, we only picked up three feet per second. That's the way that system was designed, and it was designed for two shoots, and the third one was put on for a safety factor, so we used our safety factor that day. So you're, you're back on Earth, and the, and the stereotype of like the, the macho test pilot is to stand in a bar and tell bar stories and about what it was like to go to the moon, and everybody laughs. And, and of course, you've never, you've never done that. You've never stood in a bar and told, <laughs> told stories. <laughs> but, but when you first got back, you did something very unique, which is you sat alone at night and you wrote poetry. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was weird. Um, <laughs> you know, I do have a book of poetry, um, and I'm going to publish another one soon. But uh, I've been asked about it, did you write the poetry in flight? And I say, absolutely not. Uh, I didn't have time on flight to do anything except what the flight plan told me to do. When I was in orbit by myself, I worked 20 hours a day. I got four hours sleep a night. Uh, all three of us in the flight, we worked really, really long, long hours to get all the science done that we had to do. You didn't have time to think about anything else. You, you were really focused on the flight plan and on the experiments you're going to do and the things that are coming up and getting ready for maneuvers and all that kind of stuff. It was after I got back that I began to reflect on all of that and the experience and what I was thinking at the time and what I was doing and all that. Uh, go back in history. If you recall, the first flights went into quarantine after flight. Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 went into quarantine after the flight. Apollo 13 come along, and Charlie Duke supposedly had the measles, which he was going to give to Ken Mattingly, and so they took Ken off the flight and they put Jack Swaggart in. Um, on the basis of that, oh, I have to tell you about it. Why did we go in quarantine? Again, Carl Sagan. Carl was the chairman of the Bacteriological Contamination Committee. Bacteriological Contamination Committee. That's a mouthful, I know. Uh, what he was charged with was taking a look at any possible bugs that we could bring back from outer space. Okay? They were worried that we might bring something back from the moon. So there was this whole protocol, and part of it was to go in quarantine after the flight. So we all seen the pictures of Neil and Buzz and Mike behind the window and President Nixon talking to him and all that. Um, funny thing, quarantine was 21 days. And I remember distinctly asking Carl, why 21 days? Why do you, why do you have a quarantine of 21 days? Well, uh, any disease that we get here on Earth is probably going to show up in 21 days. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say any disease here on Earth is going to show up in 21 days. What about bugs we bring back from outer space? How do you know? You don't. You got no clue. You know, they might show up in th six years. The other thing was that when the spacecraft gets down on the water, down on the ocean, they wash it down with iodine, and you say, same, same question. Why iodine? Well, that kills all known bugs. <laughs> wait a minute now. Come on, Carl. How do you know it's not food for something else? Anyway, this was the, kind of the arguments that were going on. And then Ken Manningly was taken off 13 because they suspect that he might have measles. And so they changed the protocol. So we went in quarantine before the flight to make sure that we were healthy on flight, on flight day. So that's, we, we changed that. We went, we, <laughs> we went into quarantine before flight, which was kind of, kind of funny. So somewhere in there, I asked you a question about poems. I have no idea where we went, but... Uh, oh, yeah, we were talking about poetry, right? See what yeah. I mean? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, we spent probably two, three weeks every single day after the flight running over to the Space Center early in the morning, debriefing all day long, going back home. And I was a bachelor living by myself, but my parents were with me during that time. And when I'd get home at night, there was always a party going on. Every single night, there was a party going on. And finally, at midnight, I'd kick everybody out. And I'm really getting exhausted because I was tired coming back from the flight. And then all this debriefing with all this partying going on at my place, and I couldn't get to sleep. Finally, I got so exhausted one night, I turned all the lights off in the house. 
got a legal pad and a pen and, and just sat and just let my mind go wild. And I started writing whatever was going through my mind. And it turned, it, it, it's now a book of poetry. Don't ask me how that happened. I don't know. I've heard things like channeling. I don't know. But I will tell you this, that I was so exhausted that my mind was just open-ended. And I was writing everything down, and it became a book of poetry. So that's how it happened. Can't explain it. One of the things I... Fun. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I, 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 I published a book of poetry a long time ago. And I never really used it very much until just lately. And I've, I, I've, I've um, been to a couple of events now where they want me to read poetry. Say, God damn, we, we sent all kinds of people to the moon, but we never sent a poet. You got it, you, you know, you're, you're it. There's <laughs> <laughs> one of the other things I'm I, gonna, I, what, I, what, 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 should, what, 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 should I quote one? Let me quote, let, let me quote you one of them. This, this is a poem I wrote during one of those extended night deals where I was just not thinking about anything. There's not one word that's been changed in this since I wrote it at 3 o'clock in the morning one night. Um, in the distance, barely seen, the thin horizon, nice between the ocean and the sky. I know that I could reach it if I had wings to fly. Then gazing upwards far away, the stars and planets dance and play in an infinite ocean of space. Like sirens of old, they beckon me to join in their embrace. Close at hand, the pelicans pass as wind whispers softly through the grass and waves gently straight upon the beach. The world is calm and peaceful no further than my reach. How can I leave this lovely place to venture forth in outer space? Consider the dangers I might find exploring Ganymede, another question in my mind. While I love the scene around, my mind imagines without bound why I feel the call to roam. Could it be a lunar flight is one small step towards home? That's the original, and there's not a word change. Now, that's something no other Apollo 11 event is going to get, that's for sure. You know, I, Buzz Aldrin will yeah, sometimes yeah, rap yeah, with Snoop Dogg, yeah. but that's not quite the same thing <laughs> as you doing your poem, yeah. is it? Oh, uh, you got to know, I also did children's television, which no other astronaut did. This is true. And that... that now, how, many, how many of you remember Fred Rogers? I did 10 shows with Fred. Why? Very, very interesting. Back then, you had to be over 16 to get on the Cape to watch a launch. And I took exception to that. So one day I picked up the phone and I called Sesame Street. I talked to the producer, Sesame Street up in New York. And I explained what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a show around a launch because this is something that the kids need to get involved in. He said, well, I don't know. He said, uh, we're doing the summer stock, and they're out doing this and that and the other thing. They're making money, and I'm not sure we could. But call me back next week, and I'll let you know, because our launch was on July 26. So I called him back next week, and he said, we've had a big meeting, and yes, we've decided that we would really like to come down and do a show around your launch, Sesame Street. But to do that, we need something from you. And I thought, uh-oh, I think the penny just dropped. What is it you want from me? Well, if you will name the command module Big Bird, we'll come down and do a show. Well, I will not tell this polite audience what I told him, uh, but, but I, I hung up and I called Fred, I called Pittsburgh and talked to Sam Wolf, who was Fred Rogers' producer on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And I, Sam and I talked for a couple of minutes. He said, you gotta talk to Fred. So I said, okay. So a couple of minutes later, Fred comes on the line. I never knew this guy. Didn't know him from Adam. We talked about what I thought would be nice to do for the kids, right? And Fred says, you know what? He said, I'm just doing a whole series on exactly what we're talking about. I'm doing a series for kids about fathers leaving home and coming back. Dad goes out in the morning, goes to the store and buys milk and comes back. Dad goes to work and he comes back at night. Dad makes a trip and he... 
Dad goes to the moon and he comes back, right? <laughs> Simple. Within 45 minutes, he had the best mobile crew in the world, the Nova crew out of Boston, signed up to come to the Cape along with him the weekend before I went into quarantine to do a show. He did that, all in one phone call. Unbelievable. So we sat in launch control, and he read all these questions from the kids, which is the kind of thing that Fred did. And, and I was very honest with him. I said, you know, some of them I can't answer, and some of them I can't, because I'd never been there. I haven't. But I tell you what, you give me the list of questions, and I'll come back and answer it at Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So we did that. I went up to Pittsburgh, and we went through the list, and that just kept going and going and going. I think I did 10 shows with him. Wonderful guy, wonderful guy. I don't know how many of you love Fred Rogers, but he's gone now, but he was a wonderful guy. He really, I tell you, he is a guy who really cared about the kids of the world. He really cared. If you want to see some of those, you go to alwarden.com, and, and there's Al with his, you know, his aviator sunglasses and his sharp early 70s suit looking all cool, and little puppets are talking to him, and he's just like, well, yes, this is what, I mean, it's bizarre in a wonderful way, but... But you, you, you took space food, you opened it with him, you got to eat it, um, you got to put on a space suit while he was watching it. It's exactly what Space Camp does way before Space Camp. It was getting kids into it, and, and it's beautiful to watch. It's like proto Space Camp. It's good stuff. Had, had to listen to Chef Brockett telling dirty jokes. <laughs> Which Fred never understood, by the way. And, and it reminds me of one other story, you know, after the flight, you're being taken all around the world, the big world tour, kings and queens, emperors, you name it. You got to meet the Pope, and the Pope had a surprising thing to say to you as well. Okay, yeah, it's funny you should pick that up. Uh, we, we made lots and lots of visits after the flight. Uh, my first visit was to Poland, where I found a very interesting thing. Poland was uh, part of Russia. Uh, they're a very communist country. But the individual people were just like anybody. And that's one thing, that's a big lesson I learned. People to people, it's great. Country to country, sometimes they have problems. Um, but one of our staffs was at the Vatican, and we met the Pope. It was Pope Paul. He's about five foot four, a little short guy. And um, he would, he'd come down the line. We had a, we had a whole string of people from the, uh, from the uh, uh, State Department, and from the Voice of America, and from others from NASA, and he came down the line, and he was shaking hands with everybody, and he just shake hands, and he'd keep moving, shake hands. He got to me, and he started shaking hands, and he wouldn't let go. Now, I'm an Episcopalian. I'm not a Catholic, <laughs> which he didn't know, of course, but he wouldn't let go of my hand, and he's looking at me, and he's, and he's just kind of, he said, I know you from somewhere, and I'm thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> where, where could he possibly know me? Turns out, that week, he had seen the special that I did with Fred Rogers. And he thought that was pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> you never know who's watching, yeah. That's... One of the other things I loved in working on the book with you were all the stories of who you work with, who you liked, who you disliked, but some of those lifelong friendships and bonds you made were, were wonderful. And, and I'm thinking particularly of Apollo 12's Dick Gordon, um, great story you tell of you and Dick and an aircraft canopy, which uh, I always loved. Dick Gordon was probably my best friend. Uh, I was his backup when he was on Apollo 12. In fact, I was pretty close to the whole Apollo 12 crew. They were a great crew. Kind of interesting, the Apollo 12 crew was all Navy and the Apollo 15 crew was all Air Force, but we were great buddies. Uh, we used to laugh about those Corvettes that they drove because the paint scheme they had on them was atrocious. But anyway, that's another story. Dick and I were great buddies, and we went everywhere for a year and a half together. And I, I, I know the story you want, the, the airplane? I, I like it. They may like it. <laughs> we, we're on our way out to uh, California one day, and uh, we're in a T-38. Dick's flying in the front seat, and I'm in the back seat. And we got our clothes in an overnight bag, and it's, you had to curl, put, roll them up in a ball and stick them in the, can uh, in, in, in the canopy between the two seats. So we take off, we go into El Paso to refuel, and um, we always did what we call a hot refuel. We never shut the engine down. We just came to a stop, and they'd plug in the fuel line, and, and, and little, little ground crew man would 
run out with a couple of tacos, and we'd sit there and have a taco and wait for the fuel to come in. So anyway, all that gets done, and we start taxiing back out to the runway, and when Dick started to put the canopy down, the clothes that we had stored in the canopy uh, between the seats had, had moved position a little bit, just enough to uh, uh, unhinge the canopy. So it came off the hooks on the back, and we couldn't fly the airplane. Couldn't fly it that way, so we had to go back. We're in flight clothes, and uh, we go back to the uh, fixed base operator, and we get one of the guys to drive us over to the commercial terminal. And if you remember back then, it was Pacific Southwest Airlines, PSA, flying all over the Southwest. And they had a flight that was going to uh, Los Angeles where we needed to go. So, you know, we got a ticket to get on that flight. But we had taken with us, because uh, you don't want to leave anything in an airplane out uh, unguarded. So we had our parachutes, we had our helmets in our helmet bags, and we had our clothes bag with us. So we get on this commercial flight, we got our parachutes on, <laughs> and they put us up in first class in the first row. So Dick and I are sitting there with our parachutes on, and as we got all strapped in, and as the pilot gets the airplane started and he's starting to taxi out, we took our helmets out, put our helmets on, put our oxygen masks on. <laughs> and, and you could feel the ripple of panic going back through the airplane. What are those guys doing up there? Why are they doing that? We, and we very calmly said, well, just in case we have to bail out. <laughs> oh, my God, you'd have thought we'd started World War III. Anyway, we had, to, we had to soothe about 100 people in the back of the airplane, and it was okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff. That's what Dick and I did. We, we were always doing something like that. Yeah, I told you they'd like this story. That's a great story. You know what? I got, I got to say this. Our training for our flight was three years. I trained on an average of 70 hours a week for three years, and I took like 10 days off in the middle of the 18-month time. So it's very intense, very tough. You really got to be dedicated to doing it uh, to make a flight. But you better have a little sense of humor to go with it. Because the only way you're going to survive all that intense training is to have a sense of humor. And Dick and I love to do, do things that, were, that we thought were funny. So I've just been told we've got time for one last question, and then we can sign some books over here. And uh, one I want to ask you is kind of along the same lines as what we just talked about. Those, that great camaraderie also resulted in a whole bunch of pranks. And I'm thinking particularly the Tahitian village. You know, if you remember that time in the 60s, early 70s, everything was tiki-themed. So let, let's go back to a, a tiki-themed hotel by, in Downey where they, uh, they build the spacecraft. And what, what did those guys try and do to you as a prank? What did you do in return? You got to be the person who gets the gotcha, OK? Um, I went to Spokane, Washington for a week doing desert survival. And I had, my, I had an airplane there, so when we're done with the desert survival, I jumped the airplane and went down to L.A. And, of course, I hadn't, we're, we were surviving in the desert, so I got in the airplane, never took a shower or anything, just went down to L.A., got out of the airplane, drove over to the Tahitian village, which is where we stayed. It's just a couple blocks down from where the North American plant was. And uh, checked in, went to my room, opened the door, walked into my room, and there was not a damn thing in the room. It was completely empty of everything. Well, I knew what they were doing. I knew right away what was going on because there were a whole group of guys sitting in the bar when I went by. And um, so I thought, you know, I, I've, I've got to turn this around somehow. What can I do? Well, I called the telephone operator at North American who was an older lady. She was back in her, she was in the 80s back then, but she's still a telephone operator. So I called Ruby and I said, Ruby, here's my problem. These guys have taken everything out of my room because I just got off of Desert Survival. They're playing games with me. What can we, what do you think we could do? She said, come and get me. And we'll go to my place and we'll get you fixed up. So I said, okay. So I went over and picked up Ruby. We went to her place. We took all of the ashes out of her fireplace. Uh, we got a whole box full of canned baked beans. Uh, we got pots and pans. We got a couple of chairs, fold up chairs. Uh, we got uh, some sleeping bags, and we went back to the room, and we put papers down, built, 
a, a, a phony fire with all those ashes that we had. We had sticks up, and we had a big stick down to the floor, and on the end of the stick, we opened up a can of beans and stuck it there. And we had the chairs, and we had the sleeping bags and all that. And I went out around the pool of the Tahitian village, uh, which was pretty wild back in those days. It was infested with frogs. And I captured, I think, two dozen frogs, and I let them loose in the room. <laughs> and then I took a shower and changed clothes, and I kind of sauntered into the bar and, uh, to see, see what would happen. And of course, immediately I started getting questions about, hey, Al, how'd you like your room? It's okay. Hey, Al, your room okay? It's okay. Al, we, we heard something about your room. Uh, you sure it's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Al, can we go see your room? Sure. <laughs> Be my guest. So they all traipsed back there and saw the room that I had fixed up. Got them good. Got them good. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you got to do. If you're going to... If, if you're going to survive in a system like we had uh, back in those days, it, you, 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 you can't let anybody get anything over on you. I got to tell you one more that's really funny. Wally Shira was probably the biggest prankster in the whole program. He did gotchas on everybody. We're doing a fundraiser for the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, and we're on a paddle boat on the Mississippi. And there were a bunch of us. Uh, Gordon Cooper and his wife were there. Scott Carpenter and his wife were there. My, I was there with my wife. Um, and Wally was going to meet the boat a couple of days late. He couldn't get us. He couldn't pick us up in New Orleans. So we're uh, we're up to Mississippi, going up towards Natchez. And I decided that if he's going to be late, then we gotta we gotta make him pay for it. So I went to the hotel manager and I said, Hey. You know, while he's coming on in two days, we gotta we gotta do something. So he's great, great guy. Still friends. He runs a he runs a resort in Indiana today, and he's a wonderful guy. Big, tall, about six foot four guy. Absolutely white haired, good looking Italian guy. He says, "I think I got an idea." So what he did is he got his he's got his assistant, who was a really good looking girl. Okay, so they we fixed up Wally's room, and so. And, and, and so he and this girl were in bed in Wally's room, right? And he was on top of her. And Wally comes on board. And we know he's coming because we got all the radios telling us in, and we know exactly where he comes to the door. Oh, in the meantime, the Coopers and the Wordens and the, and, 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 and the Carpenters are all in the bathroom being very quiet, you know? And they, you got to come off the central corridor, go past the bathroom into the major part of the bedroom. Wally comes down there, they open the door, he goes past the bathroom, he goes into the bedroom, he looks and he sees this guy on top of this girl in his bed and he is really shocked. The girl sees him, she's looking over this guy, she's looking over her boss's shoulder, she sees Wally. She screamed, you could have heard her five miles away, she screams so loud. Wally jumped about five feet off the floor because it, it, it really, really shook him up. I mean, it really, really startled him. Tony, the hotel manager, looks around. He sees Wally. He says, oh, you're Wally Shira, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I'm Wally Shira. Oh, he says, here, would you do something for me? And he picks up a book off the nightstand, hands it to Wally and says, would you sign my book for me, please? <laughs> and when Wally opened the book to sign it, on the inside, in the middle of the book, was a thing pasted in there that said, gotcha. Nice. Well... Talking of signing books, it's time for us to go sign some books. Um, I hope you got an idea of just how fun it was to do a book with this guy and how many great stories are in there. But just to take it a little bit wider, to, um, you know, from 1968 to 72, only 24 people went to the moon, not been back since. We've had one of them with us today. An incredibly unique opportunity to hear some of that firsthand what it's like around the moon. So I hope you'll join me in thanking Al Warden very, very much for this. Yeah, come by. Thank you. Three, two, one, zero.